Hello. <laughs> Hi, it's great to see everybody. Um, and uh, I just want to ping the people who are calling in via WebEx to see if uh, the sound is working. If you can hear us, can you ping us back? Thumbs up. All right. So welcome to our second Data Academy course here, um, working with Teams, Git, and GitHub. Uh, I would like to introduce uh, the people who will be uh, teaching you today. So my name is Rebecca. Um, some of you will uh, recognize me from the first class that we did last week. Um, I am one of the data scientists in the Commerce Data Service. Um, we also have um, Sasan Bahadran, who is one of the um, uh, data engineers on the back-end team in the Commerce Data Service, and also Pri Oberoi, who is a data scientist here at the Commerce Data Service. Um, so just a quick word about what the Commerce Data Academy is. So this is a, an initiative um, from the Commerce Data Service um, launched in order to um, offer data science, data engineering, and web development training for free to employees um, of the Department of Commerce. Uh, so if you are interested in finding um, the course schedule or any materials like code, um, slides, materials, um, that are uh, discussed during the courses. Um, you can find them all uh, on GitHub, so it's a good thing that today you're going to learn how to use GitHub so that you'll be able to navigate and find those things. But um, uh, So we'll be uh, storing archived uh, course materials there um, in addition to information about upcoming sessions. Um, so, for instance, if you participated in last week's class, um, you can go to the GitHub page um, for Commerce Data Academy, for the uh, repository for Commerce Data Academy, and find the slides and also the WebEx um, archived recording there. Um, so if you have questions about any of the classes um, or uh, the schedule or any of the resources or materials, um, you can uh, contact us at dataacademy at doc.gov. All right. So um, moving forward, uh, I like to start off the classes by talking about goals. So I have um, you know, a set of goals for us, the instructors, things that we are trying to accomplish accomplish and a set of goals for you, which are the things that we would like you to um, walk away from the class uh, knowing or understanding. So um, for us, our goals are to sort of explain and make an argument, make a case for version control, um, which is kind of the concept that underlies Git and GitHub. Um, we also want to talk about collaboration in coding and software engineering. We want to illustrate what Git software is and what it can do, and we want to differentiate Git the software from GitHub the website. Um, they are two different things, um, but they're strongly uh, related. Um, and we want to talk a little bit about how we um, at Commerce and we as data scientists and data engineers use and integrate Git and GitHub into our project workflows so that you can start to get a sense of kind of how it fits into our work. Um, for you, uh, what we would like for you to walk away from this class with is an understanding of what version control is and why you should be using it for your projects. Um, and uh, we would like you to start experimenting with using Git on the command line um, and experiment with pushing repositories to GitHub and also to practice working with a team using Waffle IO, um, all of which will be explained to you uh, shortly. Um, so uh, we did send out a list of um, installation uh, and set up prerequisites 
um, making sure that you have a GitHub account and a Waffle.io account. Um, so once you have a GitHub account, then you can um, get a Waffle.io account, and what Waffle will ask is for access to your GitHub account, which you should grant it, because um, they work together. We also want to make sure that everybody has Git installed. Um, for some of you, uh, depending on what your computer is and what your operating system is, Git will already be on your computer. Um, likewise with Python, um, if you have a Mac, uh, your computer comes with Python. Um, and uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think all Macs still come with Python 2.7, um, although soon that will switch over to 3. Um, uh, if you aren't working from a Mac, um, and even if you are working from a Mac and you're sort of a beginner user, um, it's recommended to download the Anaconda distribution of Python. Um, it's a very nice distribution because um, it's sort of very plug and play. Um, the real kind of power um, for data science, doing data science and doing data engineering with Python is in all of the packages that come, um, that you can run with Python. And so the nice thing about Anaconda is that it comes with all of those, all of these sort of most popular packages that are kind of in use. Um, and a lot of the packages are going to be ones that we end up using um, in subsequent classes at the Data Academy. So you won't have to install a bunch of things piecemeal, um, although um, installing things on your computer is a big part of being a data scientist and a data engineer. Um, and I, I realize that, um, you know, this is going to be somewhat challenging for people who don't have administrative access um, over their computers, so um, we're all kind of working together to figure out how to make this as smooth as possible. So um, if you are having challenges um, or any problems, please do reach out to Data Academy um, at doc.gov and we can um, work through the challenges. Um, some of the information that we'll need to know in order to help you is what kind of computer you have and what your operating system is. Um, the installation is dramatically different from computer to computer and from operating system to operating system. So, for instance, um, trying to install uh, something on a Mac that's running El Capitan, which is the newest um, uh, version of the operating system for Macs, and, and doing it on a previous operating system like Yosemite um, is incredibly different. So it seems like it should be the same because the computer looks the same, and generally the operating system is very similar, but um, a lot of this, uh, the installations end up being uh, dramatically different. So um, if, uh, if you do reach out to us for help, please um, uh, let us know what kind of machine you're working from and what your operating system is. The more information you can give us, the better we can help you. Um, the other thing that we wanted to make sure is that everybody has access to Terminal if you're working from a Mac or PowerShell if you're working from Windows. Um, so those are things that are just, um, you know, part of your computer. Uh, but uh, for the most part, you know, most people who use a computer are not working in um, Bash very often or in their Terminal or their PowerShell very often um, or at all. Um, so. A lot of the work that we do um, is actually engaging with the with your computer from your terminal, um, and this does represent sort of a shift in how you use your computer and you think about your computer. Um, it requires that you kind of start thinking a little bit more abstractly about how your computer um, is organized in terms of files and directories. Um, if you are, one of the um, things that we've given you in number five, um, where it says verify your access to terminal and PowerShell, there is a link that will link you to a, um, a training that you can take for free online called uh, CLI the hard way, command line interface the hard way, which is by Zed Shaw, who is a prominent uh, uh, programmer. And he actually has a couple of trainings um, he has a Python, learn Python the hard way also. Um, but one thing that's sort of nice about his walkthroughs is that um, he really starts 
at the very beginning. So where do you find, you know, how do you open up PowerShell the first time? You know, how do you open up Terminal the first time? Um, and then all of the commands that you need um, to actually start engaging with your computer. So um, a little bit later in this uh, class, we're going to be walking through some of that. Pre is going to be walking us through some of that initial interaction with the command line. Um, I will say, you know, it's scary in the beginning because you're a little bit afraid you're going to, like, erase your entire computer. Um, and that is possible. So <laughs> don't say I didn't warn you. Uh, it's actually very hard to do. Um, uh, harder on certain kinds of computers than others. Um, if you are running, if you have a Mac that doesn't have El Capitan, um, it's very easy to delete your entire computer. Uh, El Capitan ha comes with um, uh, uh, security protocols um, uh, enabled, so it actually prevents you from being able to um, engage as dangerously with your computer. If you have a PC, um, your operating system is already set up to prevent you from doing too much damage. But um, do know that when we're like kind of engaging the command line, this is kind of super user territory. Um, and we want to start thinking about, um, you know, how we're actually directly changing um, uh, files and directories and folders uh, in our computer. Um, so before we move on, uh, is there anybody who um, needs, um, has like sort of a critical uh, problem, is having a problem with installations um, or challenge uh, that they would like to raise before we move forward? We are, we've aimed today to uh, try to make, um, you know, a lot of browser-based uh, tools um, so that you won't have to uh, uh, rely completely on um, the installations in case um, you did struggle with some of the installations or didn't have time to schedule time with uh, with ITA um, uh, or with uh, your your IT uh, uh, sector to get things installed. Um, so if you if you did struggle with that, then don't despair. Um, but these are things that you should kind of get ready to go um, for some of the future classes. Um, and everyone in the room should have access to Wi-Fi as well. And if you don't, you can get the password um, back there where Ty's standing. There's a sign-up sheet. Right. So yeah, so uh, you will want to have um, access to the internet. Um, are there any questions that are coming in through um, WebEx that we should address? No? OK. All right, let's move forward. Um, uh, so uh, I want to say a little bit more about these installations. Um, everything we point you to is going to be open source and free. We're not going to ask you to buy anything. Um, if it looks like you ended up somewhere where it's asking you to purchase something, email dataacademy at doc.gov because the intention is not to have anybody purchasing anything. Um, uh, we're also aiming to make sure this has minimal impact on your IT department by, you know, picking things that are heavily vetted um, and uh, are, you know, well, uh, well documented, have very good documentation. Um, we also have, uh, you know, sort of a, a, GitHub, a formal GitHub policy that you can find um, on our, uh, in our organization on GitHub. So the name of our organization is Commerce Gov, um, and so you can look in uh, the repo uh, policies and guidance, and there's a markdown uh, file in there. So uh, this is one of the things that you'll start engaging with when you are using um, Git and GitHub and uh, doing data science and data engineering is markdown files. Um, so these are ones that have the .md file extension. Um, we'll be talking about those a little bit later uh, in this class and probably in future classes. Um, the, um, there's a, a couple of, you can, you can open markdown files in like a basic text editor. Um, if you're looking for a slightly nicer text editor uh, that's also open source and free, um, I would recommend using Atom, A-T-O-M, Atom I-O, um, is a really nice text editor, Sublime Text, uh, three is also a nice one that's free. 
or has a free version. Um, so uh, in future uh, classes, I imagine that those will be on the list of uh, recommended installations. So if you want to kind of uh, be ahead of the game a little bit, you can check out um, Atom, A-T-O-M, or Sublime Text um, to get a sort of uh, nice professional uh, text editor tool, um, which is good for opening markdown files and also for writing code. So um, before we really kind of get into Git and GitHub, I wanted to do a little bit of review from last week. I know that um, not everybody who took the class last week is going to be taking this class and that not everybody who's taking this class took the class last week. But um, for me as a data scientist, um, there's a lot of continuity between kind of doing data science and the basics of data science and using Git and GitHub. So since for me, um, those things are pretty tightly coupled. It feels important to kind of do a little bit of review so you understand kind of how we use Git and GitHub in, in the commerce data service and how practicing data scientists and data engineers um, are using Git and GitHub uh, kind of in, in practice. So uh, what is data science? This is a question that's open to people who are in the room and also who are joining us via WebEx. So feel free to um, chime in either, either via text or if you're in the room, just shout it out. Very good. Thank you. I, and I'm glad it looks like you were taking notes in the last class. <laughs> so I feel very gratified by that. Thank you. Um, so uh, for... To just to chime in with uh, what the folks on the WebEx are saying. Uh, one person said finding patterns in large data sets. Very good. And someone else says looking at data for patterns. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the pattern stuff is actually some of the, you know, the, the exciting stuff that is going to start coming up in a lot of the classes. Um, Pri is going to be t teaching a class um, in, in a couple of weeks um, on uh, data analytics with R and um, She'll be able to kind of show some um, some examples of kind of that pattern hunting, and then when we do machine learning, um, that's a lot about um, finding patterns. Um, but uh, here's our definition from uh, uh, our chief data scientist here at the U.S. Department of Commerce, um, Jeff Chen. So he says, data science is the practice of transforming raw data into insights, products, and applications to empower data-driven decision making. Um, and then as we talked um, last week a little bit, uh, data science sort of combines a lot of methods from other fields, um, these sort of time-tested, time-worn methods from fields like statistics and computer science and operations research and design and the natural sciences um, in ways that are particularly well suited to the data age where um, we're dealing with large, large amounts of data. Um, these methods, which range from data mining and visualization to predictive modeling, can scale from small to large data sets and handle um, structured data as well as unstructured data like text and images. Um, so how is data science different from data analytics? So um, we had somebody say that it's different because it's a little uh, more oriented towards hacking skills um, and computer science, which is a good answer. Other suggestions? We have anybody on the WebEx who wants to chime in? Um, so one thing that I would argue is you know, somewhat different is this notion of hypothesis-driven development. Um, you know, where I was, I'm kind of thinking of data analytics as, um, you know, largely being a lot of sort of one-off uh, reports. So you need to answer some kind of question, 
So you open up the spreadsheet and um, you do some analysis on it and you create a visualization and you put the visualization in your report and you distribute it and then maybe you have a meeting to present those results and then you move forward. Um, uh, whereas in um, data science, we're really thinking about uh, what we're doing in terms of data products. Does anybody remember what a data product is? Remember our definition from last time? So something that takes in data um, and then creates more data in return. So um, likewise, hypothesis-driven development um, is sort of the way that we go about doing uh, data science. So, you know, we're looking, uh, we're not doing projects, we're running experiments. We're testing hypotheses um, and, uh, you know, these aren't just sort of one-off things. These are things that need to um, take in data and generate data in return. Um, so here's that kind of sticky note on uh, how to go through a question with hypothesis-driven development. So um, what about the tools that data scientists use? This is something that we spent a good amount of time talking about uh, last week. What are some of the ones that people remember? Python, right, right answer. <laughs> um, nice. So um, what's funny is actually I was looking back at the slides from last week and Git and GitHub are not listed um, in the slides, so I should probably go back and update those because those are ones that we use quite a lot. So from the uh, WebEx, we have Excel, Python, Access, R, Postgres, and MySQL. All good answers. And someone said Excel, bad answer, question mark. No, that is not a bad answer. <laughs> yeah, I, <laughs> Susan and I talk about this actually. Um, so we actually don't have Excel on our computers, on our dev computers for work. Um, and so it's a little bit of like a, a rude awakening when you like, you really have to embrace your Python skills and your command line skills because um, the crutch of Excel is no longer there. But I admit, like, if there was Excel in my computer, I would use it. <laughs> so I don't think it's a bad answer. I think that, you know, um, what, you know, what I want to encourage you is to, you know, if you, if you want to get into um, data science, data analytics, um, a big part of that is going to be moving beyond just using Excel. Um, but, uh, you know, I don't think that there's anything wrong with using Excel uh, as long as it gets you where you want to go and then the places it can't get you. Um, R and Python and tools like Postgres that can handle a lot more data um, or PSQL or MySQL um, will get you a lot, uh, a lot further. SAS, yes. So definitely um, SAS is one of the ones that's, uh, you know, very institutionalized. Um, the only problem with SAS is that it's very expensive. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think that, um, you know, I, I think it feels sort of magical that um, basically anything you can do with SAS, you can do with R. Um, R is incredibly powerful um, and it's totally free. And so in practice, you know, a lot of, in, in the wild, you know, a lot of data scientists um, turn to R instead of SAS. Um, you know, the, the cost then, you know, rather than a monetary cost is that you don't have that support. Um, like you can't call SAS and complain um, that there's a bug or that something's not working or that you can't figure out how to do this. You have to ask Stack Overflow. Um, and they'll be mean to you uh, because that's how Stack Overflow works. But they do have all the answers. You just have to dig around a little bit. Um, so, uh, oh, more. WebEx real quick. Oh, there we go. Um, so someone mentioned Oracle. Um, Oracle, of course, is an option. Uh, it's an alternative for database storage. Um, so that's an alternative to MySQL and Postgres, which were mentioned. Of course, Oracle is, you know, requires a paid license. <laughs> um, so I'd say, you know, a lot of data scientists tend to use 
the, the free alternate versions unless they have access to those things. And Sasan, you've used both, you've used sort of um, like enterprise-wide um, paid uh, solutions for databases, and you've also used Postgres. You, you use mostly Postgres now, I think. Yeah. But yes, yeah, Sasan is a great person to talk to, to speak to this because he, like his, uh, you know, his main line of work is the sort of back-end component, um, which is really about um, building robust um, and secure databases um, that can persist over time and can stand up, um, you know, very sophisticated applications on top of them. And so if Sasan likes Postgres, um, then you know it's good. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> I do like Postgres. Um, I. I originally started working with uh, SQL Server, which is another alternative, of course. Um, then I kind of moved more into the open source world, and I find Postgres easy to use and free, so that's always nice. Um, but then, of course, there's many other options for your storage of your data. You know, you, it could be stored in files. Um, you could have a key value pair store like a MongoDB. You could have it in Hadoop. So there's endless options. It all depends on the size, um, the scope, and the size of the, uh, the type of data you're working with. So. Yeah. Good point. Um, so we also talked last week about the data science pipeline. Um, so does anybody remember? These, this is sort of the visual, that visualization of kind of how, how it churns. Do people have a, an idea of what the pipeline you have that image burned into your mind yet? So what are the phases of the pipeline? You don't have to name them in order. Does anybody remember any of the phases? Ingestion. So that's getting the data. Yep, cleaning. So we call that, you know, munging or wrangling. Right, modeling, so um, that's prediction. That's um, where a lot of the magic is. We've got, um, uh, you know, statistical analysis. Um, we've got uh, visualization also. Um, so here's that. This is every class that I teach is going to have this slide in it, FYI. I'm going to quiz you every time. And, uh, I just want to. There we go. I just want to chime in, too, uh, which is one important thing that you and I have spoken about before and someone mentioned uh, on the chat, which is feedback, um, which is always an important part of the data science loop because you want to feed additional information back to your system to make it smarter. So. Yeah, thank you for pointing that out. I think, you know, one of the weaknesses of this representation, I mean, it, we do kind of have this, um, you know, translucent white arrow going from reporting and visualization back up to data ingestion. But um, for a data product, you know, this is where the data that you've generated um, kind of gets re-ingested and then goes through the pipeline again to refine your model or to adjust um, as the input changes over time. Thanks for pointing that out. Um, so I, uh, we already talked a little bit about what is a data product, so this is something that's taking in data um, as the input and it's outputting more data in return. Um, so this question of data products being different from analytical insights, you know, is, is something that we've already uh, gone over a little bit. Um, you know, what I really, the sort of take home message here is that um, is that feedback component that um, that's sort of critical to data products, and also um, you know this notion that we're doing an experiment. Like this isn't a project. This is an experiment, and everything we do, um, because it's an experiment, everything we do needs to be documented and needs to be reproducible, um, because that's the science part of doing data science. Um, and the reason that it's important for us to be going over um, all of this review is that um, uh, version control is sort of the solution to 
to that. So being able to um, produce things that are repeatable and to do that documentation and being able to revert to um, a version uh, that was working um, and uh, kind of go back in time, version control is the solution to doing that. Um, so, uh, version control is also a solution to another problem in data science, which is, um, have you heard this quote um, that uh, data science is a team sport? Has anybody heard that? Um, so this is something that uh, DJ Patil, the uh, chief data scientist of the U.S., um, ha says a lot. So if you follow him on Twitter, um, it's definitely something that you will have seen before because he, um, this is a phrase that he throws out there a lot, that um, data science is a team sport. So when we're working with a team um, and a lot of people are contributing code and making edits at the same time, uh, you can imagine that there's room for collision, let's say. Uh, so if two people are working on the same file, and you may have experience with this, you know, maybe working with, um, you know, other types, other types of files like documents um, or spreadsheets where two people are making changes at the same time and maybe make changes to the same paragraph. Um, and so how do you resolve um, that collision it is a big part of, is a big problem. Um, and, you know, if it's a document, it's sort of this kind of tedious process of deciding, you know, whose edits um, are prioritized, um, you know, like, so if your boss made the edits and then you made the edits, maybe you prioritize your boss's edits over your own. Um, in code, it's a little bit different because in code, um, you know, deciding whose edits to prioritize has a lot to do with, you know, having code that actually compiles. Um, so it's not always about, you know, who has more power. It's about whose code is actually functioning um, or functioning the best. So in practice, you know, collaboration with a data team and a data group is a lot about finding smart ways around these collisions. And um, Git and GitHub offer a lot of really fantastic resources for, um, for those kinds of uh, problems. Has anybody ever seen anything like this before? What is this? Pro yep, project tracking. We have someone saying Kanban. Yep, so we got some, um, some people uh, who have maybe a little bit of experience using this um, on dev teams. Um, so this is, you know, there's, there's a lot of names for what this is. You know, it's project tracking. Um, you know, some people would call this like a scrum board. Sprint board. Sprint board. Um, so what is, what is this for? So for the people who do recognize what this is, what's, what is it for? Uh, someone said to keep track. Yep. Keep track of what? Project tracking, someone else said. Uh, another person says tracking tasks, organizing. Mm -hmm. um, so tracking tasks, maybe tracking who's responsible for what. Status updates, project management. Yep. So all of those things. Um, so another, so the reason that we pointed you towards Waffle, which is the sort of add-on to GitHub, is that for a lot of us, we're using Waffle as the sort of digital equivalent of this. Um, the nice thing about using Waffle is that it links up directly to your GitHub repositories, meaning that um, you can actually, uh, th so this is sort of what a um, Waffle looks like. Um, each of the white boxes is an issue in GitHub. Um, so issues are, you know, these sort of post-it notes, right? So um, this is what it looks like. 
with post-it notes. Um, and on a waffle, each of these um, white squares or rectangles is an issue, is, is a project, is a task that we're working on. Um, and there's a backlog um, column, a ready column in progress, and a done column. Um, the nice thing about Waffle is that you can, uh, you know, you can drag and drop these issues. So, you know, you move something, when you check something out, maybe you move it from ready to in progress, you finish it, you drag it into done. Um, you can use Waffle to um, assign things to people. Um, there's like, you know, chat tools, so I don't know, you know, how well you can see this, but, um, you know, if I clicked on this, it would open up the issue and I could um, add um, information there. Uh, you can flag things um, with these labels um, to talk about, you know, what the, uh, what that issue is associated with, if it's a bug fix, um, if it's a question. So there, it comes with a lot of really nice um, features for doing this sort of project tracking. So, um, so yet another argument for using uh, GitHub and Waffle to do uh, this sort of teamwork. Okay. So, what is version control? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Someone in the room is talking about like being able to retrieve kind of old versions in case you break it or you realize your changes maybe weren't so great. Um, any other examples of like what are, so if you, um, we don't have to think of version control only in terms of code, right? Um, everyone here I'm sure has had to collaborate with someone um, on a PowerPoint or on a document. And what was it that you used at the time to make sure that the both of you could either work at the same time or at least know what the other one did? What? Google Docs, Google Docs yeah. Track changes is handy. What else? SharePoint, someone said. SharePoint, did you have one? Same thing. Yeah, yeah, and those are all good examples. Those are examples of like where you can track changes and Google Docs will allow you to see who did what and what, specifically what they updated. A number of those allow you to revert back. Um, so yeah, we got a couple of these. Google Drive, SharePoint, I don't think we heard Dropbox, but Dropbox, um, Bitbucket, which has anyone in the room used that? Um, and Wikis, so. So we don't have to think, we, there's value in version control and like we use it I think more in our day to day, day lives than um, we might be able to think of as we were going through this. So now that we know a little bit of like what version control is in terms of code and in terms of other ways that we've used it, um, tell me about like what problems version control helped you solve or avoid perhaps. Yes. Yeah, yeah, it allows you to go back to old versions, pull out things that you either deleted or added and removed, like, yeah. Hallelujah. <laughs> so many times that happens to me. Um, when you're in Google Docs, I, I really like the ability to be able to like see someone else editing it, right? That's a really handy one. So it allows you to collaborate with people. Um, what else? Uh, so let me go over some of what people said in the WebEx. Um, so we have revert back to certain code, prevents overriding someone's changes, mm -hmm. keep track if various SOPs on the wiki, and view what changes were made between versions. Yeah, I like that, right? So, and that's a lot of that's like kind of communicating with other people. Um, I imagine something else that everyone's done is like flagged something for someone, right? Like not like flagged something or brought up an issue with a component or the document itself. Um, you could also see what has been done recently. And like Rebecca mentioned, sometimes it's handy to see who did it. Right? 
Um, so I think we went over a bunch of common features just now. So we went over being able to collaborate, uh, being able to make changes and for someone else to see them or approve them. Um, we talked about communicating with people, bringing up issues, um, reverting to old versions. That one's a popular one in this room. Um, what's been done recently and who made particular changes. Did I miss anything? Did anyone else bring up anything that I just missed? All right. So yeah, definition, right? Manage, management of changes to electronic documents, particularly computer programs. But when we're talking about software engineering, um, I think this one makes a lot of sense, like revision control. So practicing um, the practice of tracking and providing control over changes to source code. So I would like to hear about instances where either you could have used some version control, like you could have definitely, or the system that you have in place for controlling, collaborating with other people and like versioning didn't work out so well. I knew a hand would go up on that real quick. Oh, here's a mic. One of our analysts who is a SaaS user um, made one small change to their program, and that was that change, I believe, was to remove some code that they had previously needed and didn't need anymore. Uh, they accidentally deleted a little more than they should have, and their program stopped working. And so called me in a panic. I believe she called me around 3.30 in the afternoon with a 5 p.m. signature and was, of course, freaking out that her program was no longer working. Uh, fortunately, I was able to look at our boilerplate version of the program and see what she had deleted that was necessary. Uh, it was actually pretty obvious because there was section 2A, B, and then like 2F. <laughs> yeah. So she deleted a couple of like numbered sections. But uh, yeah, if she had had a previous version that she could have just looked at right away or been able to hit the undo button, I think she hit save, close, and then she no longer had that option, um, she would have been able to figure it out herself and not had that minor heart attack before she could get her program running again. And I think you brought up a new one, though, a new feature we didn't talk about, right? Like being able to look at the differences. That's really handy. Or the, well, you know, when bits of the alphabet are missing, that helps too. <laughs> Anything else? Do we have any of our chat? All right. Um, is one behind the laptop? There we go. So someone said, had a problem with crossing the streams, so to speak. I was in the middle of a complex task when a stakeholder asked me for a new feature. I couldn't do the new feature because the entire project was in pieces. Yep. We had to pause for, yeah, <laughs> pictures here. So, <clears throat> so at the beginning, I talked a little bit about how, um, you know, part of what we need to do when we're learning how to be like data super users is that we need to start thinking about our computers a little bit differently. Um, so we, um, we're used to kind of thinking about our computers as being organized, you know, um, with these sort of graphic representations of folders and files um, on a, you know, something called a desktop um, and kind of navigating things maybe through Finder um, so part of what kind of needs to happen as you're learning um, this stuff is sort of starting to think um, a little bit more abstractly um, about how things are working underneath the hood. So um, I would like to kind of offer you this visualization, um, you know, as a alternative to kind of how you um, you may be your standard, you know, thinking about what files look like in your computer. So um, the gray box is your computer. Um, and then on the right-hand side are all of the versions of the file that you've worked on. So you started with version 1, um, and you checked out version 1. You made changes, you checked it back in, and it became version two, right? So version one and version two um, are different. Uh, they're the same file, but they're different versions of that one file, right? So then version three, you know, you check that out, 
And what it looks like when you check it out is it kind of goes into this um, working directory space. Um, so this is signified here in the visualization um, with the, you know, the blue oval. Um, so when you finish working on this file and you check it back in, what happens? What's going to happen in the visualization? Right. So uh, we'll go back and in the version database, there'll be a new gray oval um, called version 4. Um, and version 4 will include all of the changes that you made um, when the file was checked out. So are, we, are you all with me? All with me on the WebEx? Um, so let's think a little bit more about what's happening during, uh, during this process. So here we've got, uh, here's another kind of way of looking at this. So we've got versions 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 on the top. Um, so here's an example where we have a branch. Um, so branching is something that we're going to talk about a little bit more this afternoon. Um, and it's a big part of using um, Git. Um, it's a big part of software engineering is, is kind of developing these um, alternate branches. You know, one of the people in the audience talked about having a kind of template version, which is like the master copy. Um, and then there's a, you know, checked out version, a branch um, that is kind of running some, you know, some new version maybe that has new features or something like that. So um, branching uh, is done mostly either to fix bugs or to introduce new features. Um, so we want to keep the software running um, while we're checking something out um, because maybe the bug we're fixing is a small bug and it doesn't impact everyone. So we don't want to take the software completely offline because there's a bunch of people using it in our scenario. So we check out a version, um, and in that version where we see A, B, C, um, we're going to try to fix this small bug that's presenting some problems. Once we, we've fixed it and we know that it's functional, then we can push that branch back in. Um, and so this is what's happening in version 6. So in version 6, we merge um, our branch, our bug fix branch, or maybe it's our feature branch. We merge it back in to master. Um, and so now, moving forward, uh, the software is operating without this bug that we've that we fixed, or with uh, it's now operating with this new feature that we've introduced. Um, so what this looks like on GitHub um, is something a little bit more like this. So um, the abstraction here is nice because it's very simple. In practice, um, an actual workflow will kind of look a little bit more like this. So master is this dark. Um, blue or dark uh, black line that you can see is persistent over time. So master never goes offline. Um, but over time, you know, we have, um, you know, we have branches. We have a blue branch um, that's sort of running in parallel. We have little pur purple branches that are branching off from blue. Um, and you can see periodically um, that purple um, and blue get pushed back into master. So this is what, you know, what the development process actually looks like in practice. So um, part of the problem you have to solve with version control is deciding um, where master lives, you know, where the master copy is, um, where it's housed. Um, and there's sort of two options. You can either have it um, have these branches, these versions, uh, uh, distributed um, across a lot of machines, or you can have it sort of centralized to one. Um, so in a centralized system, it looks something like this. Um, we have this um, master at the top, um, and in order for, you know, these three computers, we'll call them like A, B, and C, um, for them to communicate with each other, um, like, so let's say, um, you know, version A um, is working and version B is working, you know, they're working on separate features. Um, in order for version B to get the features that version A is working on, they are going to have to talk to this, you know, this master at the top. They're going to have to push their changes back and pull the changes from master um, to get those updates. So this is sort of a centralized system. So what, um, what do you think the benefits um, and weaknesses are of a centralized system? Yeah. 
Yes, so that's a great example. So real-time bug fixes are um, a lot harder when there's this sort of gatekeeper um, at the top. What are some of the benefits? So it, it, it definitely is nice when there's one person in charge of deciding how to merge things. Um, that in practice ends up being very nice. And even people who use sort of distributed systems um, in practice, there's sort of you know somebody who is the gatekeeper because when you don't have a gatekeeper, there's more collision, right? Let's see, on the WebEx we have, if you need a file, one would have to wait until someone else is finished. Uh, benefit, we all know, which is master area, and someone else says simultaneous edits. Yeah, yeah, those are all, um, you know, th these are some of the kind of the features and also the potential weaknesses of a centralized system. So with a decentralized system, um, you know, there is no boss, um, and we can communicate with each other um, a, B, and C um, are kind of free to, to interact with each other, um, which is nice. There's, you know, another, there's a degree of freedom, which can be an advantage. Um, but on the downside, uh, there's no kind of gatekeeper. So, you know, if there's malware on one of these computers, um, like the potential for uh, contagion, you know, is much higher, right? Um, and also collision. <clears throat> okay, so what is Git? Does anybody already use Git on their local computer, or have they used it um, before in another way, a little bit? Folks on the WebEx, uh, some of them seem to have used it before. Uh, someone mentioned using Bitbucket earlier and SVN uh, subversion. And we're getting some other yeses as well. Okay. And Sasan, you've used <clears throat> you've used Subversion before, right? Yes. Um, so uh, for people who have used things like Git or things that are um, you know, Git or something different but similar to similar version control software, um, what is uh, using Subversion like? Um, well, the way that I was using it is there was also a local client. Uh, similar to Git, um, but I was not using it on the command line, so it tended to be, it was more of a GUI-based experience on uh, Windows machines. Um, but, you know, in some senses, it was a similar experience, but I will say uh, with other version control systems that I've used in the past, um, one, one thing that I remember was, uh, it was there was more of a I guess the centralized model maybe where someone could check out a file and then that file is locked and no one else can get to it until that person checks it back in, which is very annoying if you want to take a look at that and, and also edit it. And so um, that's where I think something like uh, Git with a distributed workflow comes into handy when you can always have a current copy of the code, you can always view it, you can play around, experiment, do whatever you like, and, uh, you know, it just integrates nicely. Yeah, I think um, I have never personally used anything other than Git. Um, so the whole time that I've been doing data science, I've done it entirely using Git and GitHub. Um, but, uh, you know, Git, uh, you know, so their tagline is distributed is the new centralized. Um, so, uh, what they say about themselves is, um, we're a free and open source distri distributed version control system designed to handle everything from small to very large projects with speed and efficiency. It's easy to learn. It has a tiny footprint with lightning fast performance. Um, it outclasses SCM tools like Subversion, uh, CVS, uh, Perforce, and ClearCase case with features like cheap local branching, convenient staging areas, and multiple workflows. So, um, and I can attest that, uh, you know, in order to really use Git, 
you really only need to know about five commands. <laughs> um, and you can get away, you can do a lot with just, you know, basically five commands. Sasan is going to walk us through, um, in a little bit, he's going to walk us through um, maybe like kind of the top ten commands um, that we use in uh, Git. But uh, you can really do quite a lot um, and not have to learn very much. Um, so that's, um, you know, another argument for using Git is that um, compared to some of the other tools, um, you really, you know, you can start being a user pretty quickly um, and then over time build expertise and learn, you know, some of the fancier tools. Um, there's a woman in our office, um, Allison, uh, who is the head of the um, data, uh, the back-end engineering team, um, and I would say that she is an advanced super user of Git. She knows way more commands than any of us. Um, so if we have an advanced Git class, it would be Allison teaching that class. <laughs> um, uh, so um, for people who are still um, kind of at the installation phase, um, we have uh, some information here about how to um, install Git on Windows. Um, so the URL um, for that is gitforwindows.github.io. And for Mac, it's a little bit easier. Um, uh, it's, um, and the, the URL for installing on Mac is git-scm.com slash download slash Mac. Um, so just to kind of talk a little bit about where Git came from. Um, it was originally conceived of by Linus Torvalds. Does anybody recognize that name? Does it ring a bell? Yes. So he is the, um, the originator the prime originator of Linux. Um, so uh, essentially what happened is that uh, his team was using BitKeeper and um, had been very happy using BitKeeper and didn't have any problems with it. And then all of a sudden, BitKeeper changed its uh, sort of structure um, and wanted a lot of money um, and to be able to put tighter controls on things. And his team said, well, then we will make our own tool. And they built Git. Um, so it's a distributed version control system, it's open source. Um, the initial release was in 2005. Um, all of the metadata um, is stored in a directory that's a .git. So you'll start to see this um, once you initialize a repository, um, all of a sudden a new little thing will pop up, um, uh, which will be this, this .git um, area that has kind of all of this information. So it, it has all this information that we've been kind of alluding to, like the provenance, you know, where um, where the file originated, what changes have been made um, in the re most recent commits, um, who made those changes, um, you know, and kind of where the changes are located. So it kind of gives you this map to um, what's what's happening. So all of that metadata is then stored in um, the Git directory. So, um, you know, this is, I feel like uh, I'm hitting you pretty hard on the advantages, so um, clearly I'm like, I already drank the Git Kool-Aid, but um, it does have um, significant advantages. It's um, very fast. Uh, it's very simple. Uh, it's, it makes um, doing these kind of branches for adding features or fixing bugs extremely easy. You can have a lot of people working on features at the same time. So you can have a software project that hundreds of people are working on and have different branches going on. Um, and it can support, you know, a lot of branches. It's fully distributed and it can also handle um, very large projects. And if you don't believe me, then you, and you know about Linus Torvalds, you know that Linux, uh, the Linux kernel is able to run efficiently um, on Git, which is really saying a lot because that is a very complex kernel. Um, so, again, we're kind of going to go back to this idea of thinking about what is actually going on inside of our computer. So we, we're kind of trying to move away from thinking about this sort of Windows-based um, metaphor, you know, seeing things as these little boxes on our desktop, you know, and kind of hunting through um, files. So, so what I want you to be thinking about in terms of Git is that there's sort of three places. 
and I put places in quotation marks because, you know, this is all virtual, right? So um, the places are the object database, the staging area, and the working directory. Now, we saw that visualization before um, that was the local, the local version of that. So it had, this was the visualization that had, um, you know, four different versions or three different versions on the right-hand side and on the left-hand side, um, it had the file that you checked out. Um, so uh, the working directory is that place where the file is. The object database is the place where the metadata is. Um, and then the staging area is something that we're going to talk about a little bit more. Um, the staging area is the place where you, um, where you communicate that you're ready to push something back in, like you're going to check something back in. So the staging area is sort of um, this, this liminal space between um, Place, uh, the place where you're actually working on a file and the kind of the storage place, um, the staging area is somewhere between. Um, so likewise, we've got these kind of three stages that I want you to be thinking about. We've got stuff that's committed. So this is, you know, changes that you've already committed. The metadata has been updated. Um, staged means, um, staged is before something has been committed. Um, so if you've staged it, you, it's ready to be committed, but you haven't committed it yet. Um, modified means that this is a file that you've changed, but you have not staged those changes yet, and you haven't committed them yet. So this is something that will get easier over time, and as you kind of start playing with um, Git and GitHub um, on your own machines, these are things that quickly become sort of second nature, but in the beginning is a little bit challenging because a lot of us are just used to kind of thinking about our computers in a very, um, in a very different way. So I think like it might be helpful there to have like a little example like yours, right? If you're the person that had been working on that bit of code, um, could you go back one? So um, if while they're making their changes in a deleted section like B through F or C through F, um, they, at that point, it might be modified, right? And then they caught that something had broken. And the reason they wouldn't stage it is because they know that they've broken something and it needs to be fixed, and they need to like update that code before they um, want to stage it. And then once you had fi once you'd helped them fix it, then they might stage it and be like, yeah, no, this is good, mm -hmm. and then commit it. Yeah, I think um, that's that's a great point, Pri. I think um, there are sort of two ways. There, 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 there are a lot of different ways that people actually use this in practice. But one of the things that Pri said that's important is that you know it's important when you're working with a team to kind of talk about what it means to stage and commit things together, so you all have a shared um, understanding of what you're going to be committing. So if you're working on a project just by yourself, you might actually stage and commit changes um, for code that's broken. Um, because you have to stop working on it and you have to switch to another project and you kind of want a placeholder um, and you know you're going to go back and you already like kind of wrote yourself some to-dos in the code so you know you're going to go back and you know what to fix. If you're working with a team, it's very dangerous to commit things um, uh, that are broken, that are not functioning um, because essentially by committing things and pushing things back, you're communicating that something is ready to get merged back into master. Um, and if it's broken, it's not ready to get merged back into master. And I was just going to add something in real quick, too, which is more of like, I would say, falls in the advanced Git usage, in a sense. But uh, something that I use often is uh, Git stash. Uh, if you look that up, um, you'll find that sometimes you're working in a directory, and you may need to pull in some of the latest changes, but you have made some changes to files and you are not necessarily ready to stage or commit those. So basically, um, you can get stash them. And what that does is it's basically like a clipboard. Like if you think of a, a clipboard when you copy or cut and you're trying to paste something, it's, it's uh, pretty much like that. But the only difference I would say is uh, you could actually view your stash. So it's it's actually like a like a stack of your changes and you can see each point in which you stash something and then you can pop from that stash which is essentially like pasting so uh that's something that i find to be very useful and i recommend you guys 
take a look at that as well. Yeah, I, um, Sasan is alluding to like some of the things that make Git um, so powerful is that you've got all of these um, special commands that you can use um, to kind of better navigate like teamwork, um, you know, and in practice you still kind of have to talk to each other um, and kind of come up with a plan for what in practice those things are going to, um, like how they're going to be used, uh, uh, you know, what the kind of expectations are, um, so it doesn't replace kind of the talking to each other component, but it does kind of make collaboration a lot easier. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I, I to, just to kind of offer a visualization of what we've just been talking about to sort of support this transition from thinking about your computer, you know, as just a, um, you know, kind of a passive user to being a more active super user of your computer, uh, here's a visualization of kind of what um, you know, what the process looks like. Um, so we start um, over here on the left-hand side. We um, kind of, we communicate with the Git repository, the directory. We, we're going to check this out, check the project out. So checking it out means moving it from, from the repository to the working directory. So this is in memory computing. So we're in the working directory. Um, we make some changes. So after making the changes, we're going to stage them. So staging them moves them. So in, in Git commands, which Sasan is about to walk us through some of these Git commands for how you actually execute these um, this, this movement. Um, but to, to stage things, you have to git add. Um, and that kind of moves things from this area where you've been editing the file into the staging area. And then to move it from the staging area back into the master, uh, you need to commit. So um, that the command for that is um, git commit. Um, although we recommend using git commit dash m um, and then putting uh, comments in to describe, you know, what the commit is that you've just made. So Sun is actually going to walk us through that um, right now. Hi everyone. Uh, so I wanted to speak a little bit about git commands. Um, you know, I would say you can go really deep with the commands that you use in Git, but generally speaking, there's kind of some basic ones that everyone should know. So, and this all kind of goes along with the workflow that Rebecca was just discussing as well. So first. First off, we have git init. Uh, git init creates a new git repository to manage the current folder. Um, so that's your way of initializing a new git repository. Uh, one thing I want to mention in regards to git init that I think could possibly be confusing for some people is when you use the git init command, it's not like it's creating a folder on your system. Um, you either have, you know, downloaded some code from someone or you created a folder in which you want to contain all of your code and that's what you're actually initializing. So I know it, it might seem uh, like something small, but I know when I was starting out, I was kind of confused by that concept. So, you know, initially, if I was doing a project, I would want to make a folder. Um, and let's say I called that, you know, a uh, person tracker or something like that. That's what I'm going to call my project. And by initializing it, I'm essentially saying to attach um, all the Git functionality to that and to start tracking what I'm doing within that folder. Uh, so the next command is git clone. So cloning, um, is basically downloading an existing repository. So um, to give an example, let's say Rebecca wrote a program um, and let's say I either wanted to run that on my machine or let's say I wanted to contribute to that project. Um, what I could do is either get the address from her directly or um, if I know her GitHub user for instance, if she's using GitHub, 
I could go to her user page and if I knew the name of that project, I could click on that project and I could get the URL for that. And basically, um, you could, you know, type in git clone in the uh, repository address and what that'll do is it'll just download all the code for you on your machine. Um, and one thing I want to mention too as I'm going through this is that there are multiple ways of interacting with Git. And what do I mean by that? Well, at the core of it all, you're always going to be using these commands. But um, one nice thing is that there are different tools that you can install on your machine. So if you're not a command line person and you want a GUI, there are GUIs out there. Um, and those GUIs will basically be running these commands in the background for you, but they've got, you know, point and click features that allow you to have a visual interface to what is going on. Um, and then also there's uh, little helper libraries too that are nice, like Git Flow is one of them that uh, I've been using um, where it'll help you run some of these commands. It works from the command line, but it'll also help you with running some of the necessary commands uh, when you are creating a repository and collaborating and, and so forth. So, okay, next command we have on the list is... We had a quick question sure. uh, from the chat. It was like, do, they asked, do you typically clone the master or a branch? Can you clone a branch? Branch or branch? Um, yeah. So generally, you would you would clone the entire project, which would include um, the master and um, all of the branches that have been pushed to GitHub. Um, and then in your command line, you can shift between branches. Um, so uh, the command for that is git checkout, um, which I think isn't one of the ones that we're going to go over today. Um, but yeah, so if you need to check out a branch, um, you can you can use git checkout. Um, so you would clone it first, you would um, CD into it, change directories into that um, repository, um, and then from once you're inside the repository, you can git checkout um, whichever branch uh, you are responsible for working on. Yes, and we'll uh, we'll be diving into branching a little bit more uh, later on in the presentation too. Um, but you know, branching is a very important concept, I would say. Uh, going along with the collaboration aspect of Git. Um, so, okay, our next command we have on our list is git add, uh, and you can see the file path is referenced there. So, okay, so we'll run through what we have so far, right? I'm, let's say I'm creating a new project. Uh, I initialize that repository. Let's say I make a folder and let's say that project is called like person tracker. So I make a folder called person tracker. I run the init command, which initializes that repository. Uh, and then I start working on some code. So let's say I wrote some Python scripts, for instance, and I want to add that, uh, which is essentially the equivalent of what Rebecca was talking about as staging. So I can, um, I can add those files specifically by referring to them with the file path. Um, so if I'm like in the current uh, directory, I can just reference them by the actual name. If they are are in subdirectories, I can, you know, I can write out the full path to that, the relative path that is. And um, also, there's other ways to go about adding. Um, you can use git add period, get add star or asterisk. Um, there's some other ways to do it, but we won't, we won't dive too much into that now. We'll try and stay a little high level. And we do recommend, we do recommend adding, uh, using precision adding. So the way that um, Sasan is referencing here is sort of the, the recommended way of adding things. Um, so doing git add uh, period um, just adds everything, which might include things that you would don't want to stage. Um, uh, using git add dash dash all does the same thing. Um, so precision adding is sort of what the recommended um, uh, the recommended way of doing this, so that you can be very thoughtful about what you are staging. Um, 
uh, get add dash dash all is something like it's a little bit lazy and I will admit to using it um, and I always regret it um, because it's a very sort of ham-fisted way um, of staging things. So uh, here where you see like the two carrots and file path, you know, they're in, in, uh, in quotation marks or actually you don't have to have quotation marks. If you have spaces um, in your uh, file path, you'll have to use quotation marks. But um, if uh, the file that you've been working on is people.py, like some kind of py, uh, Python file, you would say git add, so git space add space python.py, and that would stage um, the python.py file. Yeah, and um, we will be you know, running through an exercise that will have you doing all these things as well. So um, be sure to know that you will be using these commands going forward in some of the exercises. Um, so, okay, so we uh, created a, a folder for a project. We uh, created a file. We added that file for staging. Um, and then next, we want to commit that file. So we went from our physical working directory where the file is located. We staged those changes and then we want to mark them for the next push. So uh, that's where commit comes in. Now, uh, why do we add the dash M tag in there? Well, so dash M signifies a message. So of course, if you're committing your code, uh, you want to be explicit about what it is you're committing. Um, and of course, people can see the specific lines of code that you've added or deleted or altered and so forth, but the message is kind of that first level, what has changed here. Um, now, you don't have to use the dash M, but I recommend it personally because otherwise, if you're on the command line, it'll launch you into a file, which is like the commit message file. And if you're not familiar with using uh, VI or Vim or those type of command line based editors, you might be a little confused. Um, so it's a uh, it's easier way to use dash M, but of course there are other options for that. So next, some commands that we're gonna talk about here. So, and just to be clear, um, commit, as we said, marks it for your next push. Um, so one thing we're going to talk about next is fetching. Um, so get fetch means you are updating your object database, but you're not changing the working directory. So um, let's say this, this program that I'm working on creating, um, let's say I got Rebecca uh, to get involved with that. And let's say she creates some code on her machine and she pushes it to the repository. Well, I would want to fetch those changes um, from the master repository so that way I know what has changed um, since my last fetch. So the fetching, as we said though, does not actually change your working directory. And that's where the next command comes in, which is the merge. So I would say get merge, um, and you would point to your source branch. Uh, I tend, personally, I tend to like set my upstream, and then I can say upstream slash the specific branch that I'm, I'm uh, trying to update. So what get merge does is it applies the changes that you fetched using the fetch command uh, to the current working directory. And one thing that could cause is a merge conflict. Um, we'll be discussing that in greater detail later on in our class today, um, but I just wanted to just briefly comment on that. Of course, if I have changed uh, a file, let's say it's person.py, um, let's say I made some changes in that file, and Rebecca had also made some changes in that file, when I fetch that and try to merge it, if we've made changes to the same line of code or something like that, uh, you will have a merge conflict, and essentially you will have to go in and resolve those conflicts before you can merge that code in. 
which is very good, um, you know, control that's in place. Uh, so yeah, and we'll talk about that later. So next, I'm going to talk about pooling. So Git pool performs a fetch and then merges those changes into your working directory. So it's essentially like combining the last two commands that we discussed. And you can refer to the server, um, which is the project, the master repository, and then also to a branch. Um, as I said, we'll be discussing branches in further detail later on, but uh, branches are a way of, you know, having your own, uh, I guess, how can I describe it? It's your way of having your own copy of the code where you can experiment and do whatever you like. So you may choose to pull a specific branch um, rather than pulling the master. So what, <clears throat> what this would look like in the command line is like generally the server, um, the default server is origin, um, which you can change. There's nothing special about origin, but that's sort of just the default that it gives to things. So in practice, what it'll look like is git pull origin and then whatever the branch is. So if you're working in master, it'll be git space pull space origin space master. If you're working on a branch that's called develop, it would be git pull origin develop um, or git pull origin feature. Um, uh, so that's kind of what it, what it looks like in practice. So what happens if you just do git pull? It thinks so if you do git pull, it thinks it just guesses origin and master. Yeah, and that's a good point, Pri. I'm happy you brought that up because uh, you should be aware of what you are actually pulling. Um, and of course, you can always roll things back, but you know it could be a headache if you're not aware of uh, what you're actually pulling down. So that is something that is very important. So the last basic command that we're going to talk about today is uh, push. Um, so pushing sends your latest commits to the remote server. So in that example scenario I was talking about before, I make a folder on my computer, initialize the repository, um, I create some code, I stage that file, um, I commit that file with a message saying what I actually did. And then final, so the final step of that is I want to push that. So what that does is it pushes it to the remote server. And, um, you know, one concept of Git, if you remember the distributed versus like centralized diagrams is I have a repository, a Git repository on my machine. And then there is the remote repository, which is what would live in something like a GitHub or Bitbucket or whatever your version control system of choice is to host that remote repository. But I want that remote uh, copy to mirror what I have committed in my local Git repository. And that's what push does as it pushes it up there. And then of course, there's a lot of stuff that comes after pushing. Um, in, some, in some cases, um, you know, you may want to create a pull request if you forked the repository, uh, which would alert all the other members of that repository that you are suggesting merging some changes into the master repo. Um, there's, you know, uh, you can, there's a lot of things you can do within the get push um, that kind of, you know, play nicely with the whole workflow. So, okay, let's, um, Let's go ahead and go to an exercise now. So uh, we're going to allot 20 minutes for this. Um, and there's a URL here at the bottom of the screen. Hopefully everyone sees that. Um, I don't know if the WebEx folks can actually click on that or not. So if you want to go ahead and type that in. OK, great. And so what this is is, um, so this is not using the installations that you did on your computer yet. Um, what it is is it's basically like a virtualized self-contained environment. Um, and it's a nice little exercise for you all to try Git 
and try some of these commands. Um, and one nice thing is that it gives you explanation. And there's also a uh, like a directory. Uh, you can browse a directory, like the actual files on this computer in this exercise. So uh, if everyone can just take a moment to uh, work on that, um, it should kind of guide you through. And if you have any questions, uh, whether you're here or on the WebEx, let us know and we'll try and help you. Thanks. So for a little while, we're going to go on radio silent. And for the people in the room, uh, we'll have uh, people walking around um, to give support as needed. And then I'll stay by the WebEx here um, if those of you who are um, calling in uh, have questions. I'll be manning the WebEx. And we will reconvene in um, about 15, 20 minutes here. So people should just be able to start typing um, once you once you follow that link. Um, that you shouldn't have to create a count or anything like that.
Somebody, somebody on the WebEx mentions uh, that we seem to be slamming their servers right now. Um, and so if it's responding slowly, it's because um, we're just too powerful, all of us together. Uh, there are 86 participants on the WebEx and about 10 in the room. And so uh, clearly the, the upper limit for what this uh, little uh, interactive uh, guide is, is is around that. Um, so be patient if it's uh, taking a little while.
So just walking around the room, it looks like most people are um, making progress. So maybe we'll, we'll do another five minutes um, for people on WebEx. Is that, will that give you enough time to finish up? Okay, sounds like that'll be good. So we'll start back in about five minutes here.
So we're sort of wrapping up here this um, this challenge. We've got a couple of more questions that are coming in through the WebEx um, that uh, that we're answering here. But in just a uh, few moments, we're going to move forward. Um, one of the things that's nice about these interactive uh, browser-based tutorials is that um, it is a place where you can go and experiment with the commands um, in a safe way um, because, as I said, when you start interacting with your real command line, um, you can break things, um, which is uh, you know something to just be aware of. Um, we actually are going to um, move into some command line in a little bit here, um, but wanted to give you a chance to do some experimenting um, with the, the git commands before we do that in a you know in a browser based uh, application. Be good to move forward with the uh... yeah. I think we can. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about GitHub now. Um, uh, this is the mascot of GitHub. This is the Octocat. Um, GitHub is um, a remote Git repository. It's a website. Um, so GitHub is different from Git. Git is the software. And GitHub is the place, um, like a way to interact with Git repositories. Um, uh, so, so it functions as sort of the remote um, you know, in this sort of distributed system. Uh, it provides um, secure access. So, um, uh, and that actually, that security has, has increased um, recently. So now um, it's recommended to use two-factor authentication with your GitHub account. Um, so in fact, that's mandatory for everybody who's in the commerce data service. Um, we all have to use two-factor authentication. Um, you can, uh, you can, there's a bunch of tools for, um, for development with groups. Um, you can use it sort of as project management in addition to storage, which is really nice. Um, it's been around for a while, um, so uh, it's, it tends to be very secure um, and stable. I will say that um, the la in the last year or so, I have noticed um, that GitHub sometimes goes down because of like DDoS um, attacks from, uh, there have been a couple from China recently, um, uh, pretty substantial DDoS attacks that take GitHub down um, for a little while. Um, but it always comes back and um, everything is still there. So uh, there are many, many millions of users. Um, uh, so if we remember, this is something that we, um, you know, this, this distributed architecture is something we, look, we looked at before. Um, so, uh, and you remember this slide, you know, we, we were talking about kind of the Git places where there's the object database, which is where the metadata is, so this provenance about where the file has been, the changes that have gone through. The, um, the staging area, which is the place where you put things once they're ready to go back um, into storage and the working directory, which is where you're actually making these changes. So if we kind of remember this, um, so now when we're looking at GitHub, um, GitHub is that object database. Um, so uh, GitHub is the place um, that's kind of storing all of this metadata for you. Um, you know, uh, so GitHub doesn't have a working directory because it's not actually a human um, and it's not going to make changes, but it, um, it's the same, uh, you know, so the repositories that GitHub has are just like the repositories you check out and clone onto your local machine, um, except that it doesn't have a working directory. It's just the object database. Um, so uh, what it looks like when you um, kind of communicate with GitHub is, you know, so let's say Sasan and I are working on this repository together. Um, you know, we go uh, and check it out from um, GitHub and bring it down and um, have these sort of local versions on our machine of the same repository. So we make local copies 
of the repository that lives um, kind of in perpetuity on uh, the GitHub website, you know, that in that object database, right? So we check it out, make a copy, um, and it copies the version that exists in GitHub at that time. So if later changes get pushed back to GitHub, we have to use um, one of the Git commands to, to sync it up. Do you remember which command it was that Sasan taught us um, for how we would sync it up? Uh, pull. So pull will take down, um, if you already have cloned the repo and you want to get the latest changes, you want to fetch and merge, and pull does fetch and merge together. Um, so. Uh, so you pull this like local copy, you make a local copy on your um, computer, then you can make changes, and then you use push to push those changes back um, to GitHub, to this object um, database. Um, so I said this, I mentioned this before, that um, the origin remote is sort of auto automatically created when you clone a repository from GitHub. Um, it's the default. Um, that that we use for pushing and pulling, but it's just a default name, so it's not like kind of magical in any way. It's just the default, and so you know a lot of the commands you end up using look like you know git push origin master um, or git push origin develop if you're pushing to the develop branch on GitHub um, or git pull um, origin develop if you're pulling down something. Um, so what does it look like to use GitHub? Um, this is what my profile looks like. I actually mentioned last week when I was teaching um, uh, the data science basics class um, that you can you know, go and look at anybody's profile. So you can have, um, if, you, if you have a paid account, you can actually have private repositories, but by default, everything is open. Um, so, and I don't have a paid account. So uh, the, co the data service does, because we, ha we have to work on projects that need to be secure, but, um, but you can actually see everything I have on GitHub, um, because it's all public by default. Um, so uh, the other kind of nice thing is that um, there's this sort of gamification uh, aspect to contributions. So GitHub, you know, wants you to engage, wants you to use GitHub, and so they kind of make this sort of checkerboard um, that shows um, kind of visually how, how much you've been contributing. And you can see, um, you know, since I started, since I came over to commerce, um, since we use GitHub a lot here, um, uh, my kind of daily contribution uh, rate has increased. Um, you can see also here in the bottom left corner the organizations that I'm affiliated with. Um, so the Commerce Data Services there um, and a couple of projects that I was involved in previously um, and a blog that I um, uh, contribute to. Um, so you can see people's affiliations, the organizations. Um, you can have followers. Um, you can follow other people. Um, you can see, uh, you know, the, the repositories that you have um, used, the ones that you've contributed to. Um, so this is what a user um, kind of looks like on GitHub. Um, so what does a repository look like? Um, looks a little bit like this. Um, so a repository, again, is a folder, um, a directory that has a project in it. Um, uh, we call them repos for short, but it's short for repository. Um, but if you're, you know, in the know, you call it a repo because um, it's shorter and we say it a lot. Um, so uh, a repo kind of has, uh, you know, has all of the pieces of a, of a project. So it's meant to be sort of standalone. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit more about um, conventions of what these repos look like um, a little bit at the end. Um, but generally, this is what it'll look like. Um, and I mentioned also at the beginning um, these markdown files. So these are files that end in .md, the file extension. Um, so by default, um, if you include um, something called readme.md um, as part of your repository, it will automatically um, surface all of the text that's in that file on the repository page. Um, and so we might get a chance to um, look at that in a little bit. Actually, I think I might have one of these up. Um, let's see if we do. Mm. Yeah. 
Yeah. So here's a project, um, something that I um, work on uh, in my spare time because data science is that fun. Um, is a project um, with a bunch of tools for uh, data visualization. Um, so all of the content that's surfacing here is actually in this README file, um, and it automatically uh, shows all of that um, in the browser, which is kind of nice. Um, so uh, without further ado, we are going to um, switch over to doing a little bit of experimentation here um, in the command line. Um, we are going to assume that this is pretty new uh, for, for most of the people who are participating in this class. So we are going to start from like the absolute basics. Um, if you are already a master command line user, I apologize. Um, we're not intending to insult your intelligence, but I think the three of us, you know, we all had to start somewhere, and we're, we were kind of thinking about uh, starting from first principles. So um, I'm going to turn it over to Pri. So we are hoping that everyone will be able to um, get command line going on their laptop. So um, I think Rebecca and Susan are going to walk around a little bit if anyone's having a hard time. Um, just wave at them furiously. So we're going to shift to the command line. Um, and I think some of these instructions were included beforehand. So does, does everyone have either um, like your terminal or PowerShell going? Does everyone have it going? Yeah? Cool. I like the thumbs up. Um, so that's the kind of at the just baselining everyone. Um, one thing that you end up having to do a lot is look at what directory you're in, right? Because you don't have that UI anymore to like show you um, if you're in a Mac, like kind of like which which folders, 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 folder you're in. Um, so it's really helpful to know where you are, um, especially if you do get status and you get like a weird message and you're like, oh, I'm not actually in the folder that that, that houses my repo. Um, so PWD print working directory um, works in both PowerShell and um, Max. Um, so as we go through this, PowerShell will be on the top, and we'll look at Max underneath. Um, Hostname. This is kind of like the uh, username for you on your laptop. So in order to uh, create a uh, folder um, or a directory, uh, it's the same command for PowerShell Terminal. It's um, make directory mkdir, um, and you can do it like so if you were if you did mkdir temp whatever f uh directory in right now it would just create it there but you can also kind of navigate away uh you could go to you know if there was a subfolder in the one you're in called temp you would go temp and then create one called stuff inside of it great naming convention um this is all from uh the zed shaw uh, course on learn command line the hard way. So I admit I just stole uh, all of his content. It is open source, so it's not stealing. But yeah. and if you didn't know, if you didn't do print working directory, or you just couldn't, you don't want to like create some directory in the directory in right now. Um, you can always just like start from root, at least in terminal, and just uh, start with period slash and like work your way to the folder you want to create the directory in. Yeah. So um, this is you know again we're kind of. We're starting to think a little bit differently about our com computers and how the directories and folders and files are structured. So make dir is the same thing as in Finder, you know, if you right click or whatever and say create new folder, um, it's the exact same thing. And one thing that you should sort of experiment with is doing this in the command line. Um, so from wherever you are, like if you're in the desktop, let's say, um, and you say make dir, and add temp, let's say, um, go to your physical desktop, you know, your representation of your desktop on your computer, and that folder will be there. Um, so uh, it's exactly the same thing, um, but it's, we're just sort of navigating um, towards kind of engaging directly um, through the command line rather than using the, the GUI. Mm -hmm. So um, should, folks should be doing this alongside, right? So if you... Um, are in terminal or in PowerShell right now, and you print working, you do PWD for print working directory, and then you make uh, temp as a directory. Um, 
you can copy that what uh, what shows up on in the terminal under print working directory and like paste it into uh, Windows Explorer or um, just like the Finder in Macs, and then you can see your folder show up. Um, change directory, and you can this will take you. So if you just created temp, if you do cd temp, it'll take you into that folder. If you ever want to back out, like go one directory up, cd space dot dot. So this is one of the critical things when you start cloning repositories from GitHub. Um, so cloning the repository doesn't actually put you, it, it makes the copy, the local copy on your computer, but it doesn't put you inside that repository. You actually have to change directories into that repository. So let's say you were going to clone something, you would say git clone, and then you would paste in the URL, which we're going to do, we're going to practice in a little while, um, git clone, and then it, it makes that clone. But in order to actually engage with the content of that repository, you'll have to CD into it. You'll have to change directories into it. And then to get out, you would say, as, as Pre um, explained, to get out, you say CD space dot dot, and that takes you back upstream. And, and when, when it clones, it creates that directory in wherever you are at the moment. Um, this lists everything that's in your directory. So what you would do is you'd clone, you'd CD uh, into that temp that, or into the thing you just cloned, and then you'd hit LS or DIR in PowerShell, dir, um, to see what's in there. Um, so we, I think we did this CD into temp, which you just created, um, and then if you wanted to create a text file, is that what this is trying to do? Yes. Yeah. Uh, create an empty text file. Um, in terminal, you can just say touch and then name the text file, whatever you would like. Um, and then in PowerShell, new item, which has to be like uppercase N, yes. uppercase the I. Syntax is, yeah, the, the, yeah, the case matters. Um, and so just as you did when you were doing the make dir command, when you um, create a new file, I recommend that you do that and then immediately go into the representation, the, the graphical representation to see that file exists now inside that directory. Um, so it's exactly the same thing as creating a new file the way that you have been, um, but you're just doing it from the command line. Yeah. Um, and you are just on the command line, you could do ls and see if it showed up. Um, and what, like something, I think that that's something I use a lot. Um, and while I'm while I'm in a directory that I'm, where I want to push code or like I'm committing and stuff, I use the equivalent of that is like git status is just like constant between everything. Um, so this is Zed Shaw's book. Do you like it, Rebecca? Um, so if Zed Shaw is listening. Uh, <laughs> Yes, I do. And also, if he's not listening, I think that this is um, this is how a lot of people learn uh, the command line. Um, it's sort of a tough love approach. Um, you'll notice um, the introduction is called "Shut Up and Shell." Um, so, you know, it's not uh, you know, it's it's not the sort of um, touchy feely learning experience. Um, if you are, if you're kind of more into getting like gold stars every time you learn a new command, then you want to look at Code Academy. They have a command line uh, tutorial that's browser based um, and is, you know, a little bit more like lovey dovey, um, and you get gold stars um, every time you do something right. Um, and hey, nothing wrong with gold stars uh, and gamification of and learning the code. That's true. If if the Code Academy class had existed when I was learning command line, I would definitely have picked that one over Zed Shaw because he's, you know, a little bit of a curmudgeon. Um, <laughs> uh, so yeah, it, it's really kind of just figuring out what works best for you. Um, so tough love approach, then go with Zed Shaw. Um, you know, the gamification, browser-based solution, um, check out Code Academy. They're both free. Both open source, so. Um. Okay, 
So um, we're going to do workshops. So everyone should go to this link. I think you should have it. It might be in your email, in the email that got sent out. But if not, just um, type this in. And we can walk through uh, what to do about what well, we're going to do. First, we're going to repeat a lot of the commands we just did, but this time actually in uh, your terminal or um, PowerShell. And then get to instance where there is a merge conflict. And we're going to have to pair up. Um, so we have like an odd number of people. Um, so maybe we could just grab a person. Who wants this on? <laughs> cool. Good reflex. <laughs> and if you are on the WebEx and are in a room by yourself and don't have the opportunity to collaborate with somebody else, we apologize. Um, but the way that the workshop is written, you can um, at least follow through and get a feel for what it looks like to kind of engage, um, you know, create. So this walks you through uh, creating a new repository. Um, adding somebody else as a collaborator, um, and then uh, after doing that, adding some, some content to that repository and experimenting with pushing back to master, which um, the way that this uh, workshop is set up is designed to create a merge conflict, um, because that's one of the sort of scary things that you have to figure out um, early on is that merge conflicts happen. Um, but as Hassan mentioned earlier, you know, it's good that you get a merge conflict because sometimes you want to kind of manually resolve, um, you know, uh, these collisions um, rather than having them done by a computer that doesn't know what the right answer is when you do. Um, so merge conflicts are a life lesson. Yes. Basically. Um, so I'm actually going to walk through all of, like the steps that we're going to take. But does everyone have this link? You got it? Everyone has it up? OK. Um, if folks are good to get started, I can walk through like the general steps. But is everyone good? Would you rather just like jump in? A lot of the instructions are just kind of, you just kind of follow along. Uh, we can mull around the room. Uh, something folks might notice is uh, some of the screenshots for GitHub just look a little bit different than um, GitHub right now, uh, but you can still find all the same stuff. It might have just moved a little on the page. The other thing I'll point out is that um, this tutorial kind of includes, um, uses git add all, which we mentioned earlier is generally not a great um, practice. Um, so I would suggest swapping that out for git add and then the name of the file um, rather than just kind of adding everything.
So we'll check in with everyone in 10 minutes to see how you're doing um, and see if we need to add a little bit more time on. Um, for the folks that are using Windows, there's a link for like a cheat sheet for all the commands in um, PowerShell because this assumes uh, it's a, you're using a Mac.
So we're going to come back to um, the group in the next um, couple of moments here. I wanted to um, acknowledge some of the challenges that people are encountering. Um, and I just want to say, like, these are the good kinds of problems to have. Um, because this means that you are actually like learning how to be a super user of your computer. But um, you know, some of the some of the things that have come up are um, uh, what is what actually is terminal and what is PowerShell um, when you install Git, um, and also when you in install Anaconda. Um, both of those come with um, uh, Bash. When you install Python, that also comes with Bash. Um, and all of those things look pretty similar. Um, so sometimes people will be try, you know, kind of in, um, you know, in uh, like the Anaconda Bash terminal, trying to um, kind of, uh, uh, you know, do Git commands from there, or they'll be um, opening up um, their Git Bash and trying to run Python code from there. Um, so all of this is, you know, stuff that kind of gets easier um, the more and more you practice. Um, but you um, you kind of want to get comfortable with um, the sort of default of opening up um, Terminal if you're working in Mac, um, or opening up PowerShell um, if you're working from a, win a Windows machine. Um, another thing that I want to sort of point out um, is this sort of notion of pair programming, which in the room here we've got people paired up sitting next to somebody kind of working through these things together. Um, this is sort of the gold standard for how um, programming actually works, not just when you're learning, but when you're actually building um, robust code. Um, the reason is because um, two heads are better than one, essentially. Um, and so this is something that, you know, would be a good thing to get um, into the habit of. If you're um, on the WebEx and calling in um, as the classes move forward, you might want to think about kind of having a, um, like a buddy system kind of thing, you know, somebody who you can call in with um, so that the two of you can kind of collaborate um, and work on code together. Um, since that's really kind of how we do this in the wild, um, you know, the, uh, for instance, those of us on the Commerce Data Service team, um, we uh, all program in the same room together a lot of the times um, because uh, we run into problems all the time. <laughs> and so kind of having these problems where you're getting error messages and you can't push things back, um, you know, even people who have been doing this for a while kind of get used to getting those errors. And the only difference is between um, us and you is like we have a little bit more experience maybe. Um, we have learned to see the error messages as this like nice coach who's um, helping you get to the right answer rather than like somebody angrily yelling at you, which I think is how it feels in the beginning when you get error messages. Um, you start to see that per that is like a nice coach who's trying to help you get to the right answer. Um, and we pair programs, so we have resources in each other, um, and that's something that, that makes things a lot easier as you move forward. So if you didn't get to the phase of um, uh, kind of working through the merge conflict, um, that's something that you can do with a partner later on and that I would encourage you to sort of play with. Um, uh, but I think we should move forward. We've got about 30 minutes left in the class. Um, and we have um, a bit more material that I'd like to cover. Uh, the, uh, you know, the next section is really kind of talking about, um, you know, what are, um, what are some of the conventions, some of the practices that um, allow us to work um, on Teams uh, using Git and GitHub. Um, so I'm actually going to turn this over to Sasan, um, who's going to lead the next part of this. Hello. So I'm going to talk about teamwork and teamwork makes the dream work, as we all know. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, obviously Git can be used for your own projects to do version control, 
but uh, in a lot of cases, you're probably going to be using it within your organization in a collaborative manner uh, with a team of people where you guys will all be making changes. So um, here is a screenshot of our commerce data service GitHub page. And you can see all of the people that are a member of that. So that's our project team, um, as well as people that have, you know, forked our repository, et cetera, um, and a list of some projects that we have on our page. Um, so next we're going to talk about Waffle. If you remember Waffle we discussed earlier, um, it's, it's the way of basically taking the project management component and uh, integrating that in with GitHub. Um, and so, all right, I'll pull up a screenshot here of Waffle. If you remember, um, everyone should have signed up for Waffle um, prior to the course, so hopefully you uh, took a moment to look around. So um, let's talk about a Waffle page a little bit more in detail. So what can you do with Waffle? So in GitHub, um, let's see here. I'm going to... I'm going to bring up a Waffle while you talk. Sure. And I was going to go to a repo as well. So if you don't mind if I use your Orlo. Okay. And I, I have a Waffle for it already. Cool. Yeah, just bring it up in a separate tab for me if you don't mind. You can keep talking if you want while I bring it up. Sure. So, um, you know, if you remember, we were talking about Waffle. Uh, the thing about Waffle is, so you don't necessarily have to use Waffle, of course. You can open up issues in GitHub, and you can use the GitHub interface to manage those. But, of course, as we said, Waffle is one way uh, to take those issues and, you know, create a nice visual interface that allows you to bucket those issues into different categories and do some other nice things. So I find it to be uh, very useful and I'm currently using it uh, for a project that I'm working on for Commerce Data Service. So here is uh, Rebecca's um, waffle for the Orlo project that she talked about earlier. So what you can see here are some of the categories. So for instance, we have backlog, ready, in progress, and done. So I think those are the default categories that Waffle adds, but um, you can also add additional ones. Um, so like you may want something called review, um, like ready for review or so forth. And basically, if I took one of those issues and I can move that into ready and anyone else who's working on that project can know that um, you know, this issue is out of the backlog and is ready to be worked on. And you can also see um, the, so the issue is fancy ROC curve generator. I don't know what that is, but <laughs> um, when we go back to the, uh, Rebecca's GitHub page for the project, we see a tag there that says ready. So Waffle has attached that tag and uh, basically you know, it just kind of did that just by you dragging it over. So another thing is, so you can add an issue. Um, you're going to have to remember to uh, either do these tasks or remove them off your waffle board because you're creating new, 
new assignments for yourself. <laughs> What's yours? Baja. D A S X. Yep. So uh, there's some nice tricks that you can do with Waffle. Um, for instance, by using keywords. So Rebecca uses the at symbol. Um, she can kind of mention my GitHub username. Uh, there's some other cool things that uh, I've been playing with on my team, which is, for instance, if you use a pound symbol, um, you can refer to an, an actual issue. So, um, so for instance, if we look at one of these issues here, and okay, so Rebecca's just added a new issue, so you see that popped up there, and it, it also pops up on the GitHub page. So, you know, Waffle is not separate from the GitHub page, it just uh, uses the issues that are there. And so one, one nice trick that I was going to say is um, if you remember one of our commands was git commit. And uh, in the commit we mentioned using the dash m for your message. Um, so in my message for my commit I could say number four for instance which is this particular issue and it would automatically reference that. And there's other like keywords I can use for instance, uh, like closes, and um, and it would it add some features in. So in that case, once uh, if I made like a pull request and that was accepted, then the issue would automatically close. So no one would have to go in and manually do that later. So there's a lot of uh, interesting tricks like that, and I mean those tricks aren't necessarily uh, native to Waffle, but um, you can use Waffle to, you know, to do a lot of that stuff in an easy fashion. So uh, next, what we're going to do is a little assignment, a little exercise on, and it's a pair programming exercise. So basically, earlier we had you run through um, the Jupyter notebook on on accessing your GitHub account, creating a repo, cloning it, etc. So what you're going to do now is you're going to create a waffle using that project that you created in the last exercise. And everyone should have signed up for waffle before uh, the class. And if not, you can do it now. Um, and I believe you can actually use your GitHub credentials. So it should be pretty quick if you haven't done that. But um, we want you to go ahead and just create a waffle board and then try to do what we showed you, which is uh, add some new issues so that you can kind of play around and see what that would look like. So we'll give you maybe a couple of minutes here to play around with that and see if you can, um, you know, navigate to the Waffle I.O. page. Um, and from there, you should be able to access um, the repository that you just created on your GitHub account um, to play around a little bit with the Waffle um, adding issues. Uh, and then in about maybe um, three or four minutes, we'll come back together and we will finish up the rest of our slides and talk a little bit about um, how, uh, you know, how this actually works in practice for people on our team.
once you have um, a number of waffles, you can navigate between them in the uh, upper left-hand corner here. Um, so here is where I can uh, click and switch um, between different uh, projects that I'm involved on. So some of these are um, bigger projects than others and have more people involved, and some of them are smaller projects. Uh, So we'll give you um, uh, a little time maybe uh, after the class is over to continue playing with some of these um, things and um, as you uh, experience issues, um, you're welcome to reach out um, and we can kind of talk you through it. Remember when you do reach out to let us know what operating system you're using um, because as I mentioned in the beginning, uh, you know, error messages um, are highly specific to um, what operating system you're working with. Um, and also, um, one of the best things you can do is if you're having a persistent problem, if you can take a screenshot, um, do screen capture of the error message that you're getting back, um, that's, uh, so that way we can do like a traceback and we can, um, we can use the uh, error message to help navigate towards a solution. Um, so uh, one of the things that Sasan talked about a little bit was um, commit messages. So when you're working on a team, uh, commit messages um, on uh, GitHub uh, and Git end up being you know, one of the um, main sort of communication tools. Um, and uh, it's very easy um, when you're just going quickly to add commit messages that look like uh, git commit dash m and then in quotation marks uh, made updates or updated this file. Um, what I would recommend is that you pick, um, you know, slightly more specific uh, messages. Um, this is, keep in mind, this is not just to benefit your teammate uh, that you're working with, it's also to benefit you because if later you need to go back and um, walk back some changes that you committed and do a revert, you will use the get the commit message to navigate to the change um, that you made that you want to undo. Um, so being as sort of explicit as you can be um, and uh, try to make sure that you are using, um, you know, different commit messages for each commit, even if you're kind of changing the same file, um, trying to say, you know, what it is that you've changed in that file um, so that you'll, you know, not just to help your team, but also help future you. Um, so in the last 15 minutes here, I want to talk a little bit about folder structure conventions on GitHub. This is, you know, another way that we communicate with each other sort of implicitly. Um, as we're using GitHub. Um, I've talked a little bit about the README file. Um, the funny thing about Readmes is I think people don't actually read them. Uh, even though they're called README, uh, I frequently feel like when somebody's having an issue with code on a repository, um, the answer to their question is usually in the README somewhere and they just have not read it. Um, and that's, you know, that's okay. But I think that, you know, as you kind of get more familiar, um, you will start to kind of see the README as this master guide that has all of the answers to the questions you have about a repository. Um, and like I said, on GitHub, um, on GitHub you can see the README is important enough that they actually um, surface the content of the README on the um, main page. Um, so here, this text is everything that's inside this README file. Um, so one of the main conventions is to give people all the instructions that they're going to need to navigate this project in, and put that text in the README. Another one of the conventions is git ignore. Um, so there are going to be times when you are working on a project and there are things that you want to commit to the master repository on GitHub and there are things that you don't want to commit. Maybe some of those things are secure 
um, files that you don't feel um, is safe to put on GitHub. Um, uh, you know, for instance, if you are using an API and you have an API key um, to access like Twitter data or something like that, uh, you, you should never ever put your API key or token on GitHub. Once it's on GitHub, it's there forever. Um, and people uh, have like programs that crawl through GitHub looking for keys that people have mistakenly committed and then they use those keys to do DDoS attacks and to spider um, other websites. Um, so it's really important that you get used to using git ignore because git ignore is a text file um, and any, uh, any file name that you list in the git ignore that's in your repository will not get committed. Um, uh, so, so it kind of uh, partitions those, those files um, so they don't get committed back to GitHub. So things like your, um, you know, private information, um, files that are very large. Um, GitHub actually won't accept files larger than 100 megs, um, and it warns you after 50 megs. So if you have a very big file that's inside your repo on your uh, local computer, you want to put the name of that file in your git ignore in your repository um, so that that doesn't get added. And so what that looks like here is, um, so in my git ignore, these are the things that I do not want to commit. Supi is a, um, a test environment that I built. Um, slash data is a bunch of very large data files that I don't want to push. Um, and test file ping is an image um, that's a map that I use but don't want to push to uh, GitHub. So that's another very um, useful thing to know, another good convention. Fixtures um, is another convention. It's a folder inside your GitHub repository um, that you put kind of the, uh, you know, kind of building blocks of a project. So a lot of times people will put data sets in the fixtures um, folder in the repository. Um, so if you're looking for kind of what you need to set things up, um, like a database or database tools, data sets, um, that'll often be in fixtures. Do we have a question? Okay. Um, then the last thing I want to talk about is um, requirements. So requirements is a, uh, a file that you add to your repository that has a list of all of the um, packages that are required, all of the dependencies that are required to run that code. So if you're writing um, code in Python um, and people need to be able to use um, scikit-learn, which is the machine learning library that I use um, to build predictive models, um, in my requirements.txt file for that repository, I would list the, ver the, the package scikit-learn and also the version that I'm using. And the nice thing about this is that um, if you bring down, if you copy somebody else's repo uh, locally to your computer um, and they have a requirements.txt, you can pip install um, all of the requirements uh, uh, all at once before you run any of their code, which is really nice because then you sort of guarantee that people are going to be able to run um, their, their, your, their code locally on their machine. Um, <clears throat> so this is another kind of way, way in which we communicate with each other about what kinds of packages you're going to need to have installed in order to run the code. So in our last 10 minutes, I want to turn to this sort of question of why. Um, so why do data scientists need version control? So I'm going to put it to you. Um, you've just had almost three hours of Git and GitHub. And um, I think many of you took the data science basics class um, last week. So why do data scientists need version control? So yes, so we had an answer to collaborate more effectively. I wholeheartedly agree with that. Why else? We have some folks on the WebEx, so one person said, no one ever gets it right the first time. Uh, someone else said to understand the workflow. Um, some other responses we have coming in are prevent inadvertent loss of modifications 
and reproduce results, record keeping, collaborating purposes to fix issues, track progress, and lastly, to help with collaboration. Yep, yeah, and um, those are all, uh, I'm, I feel like those are all critically important to the work that I do personally. Um, if we kind of recast this question uh, in terms of this pipeline um, that I already promised you you're going to see over and over if you take more classes with me. Um, so this is the data science pipeline. Um, so where in this pipeline uh, does version control fit? We have one response from the WebEx. Anyone in person? So I'm going to ignore the first response first. Oh, somebody was mean. The WebEx people are feisty. Um. Yes, everywhere. <laughs> yeah, so. Um, trick question. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it is sort of a trick question um, because <laughs> this, you know, this is something uh, that you want to kind of have at each stage, and it's it's sometimes a little tricky to figure out how to do that. You know, so like with data ingestion, um, you know, how how do you create? You know, so let's say you have a database that you build on your local machine. Um, how do you uh, commit that? to GitHub so that other people can run queries on that database, you know, or, you know, once you've built a, um, a model um, in, uh, in your modeling and application phase, how do you um, encapsulate that model so that somebody else can run the results and get the same results on their machine? Um, these are hard, you know, these are hard things. There's solutions for all of those. So for the, you know, for the database one, you know, there's ways that you can, um, you can do like a, a dump, like uh, Postgres has like PG dump. You can dump all of the SQL commands to a file and then upload the SQL commands to GitHub. Um, for the modeling and application uh, phase, um, there's a, a number of solutions for kind of encapsulating a machine learning uh, tool. In Python, we use Pickle, um, which you will learn more about if you are going to take my machine learning class. Um, so pickling is a way to uh, encapsulate your predictive model so that other people can run it and get the same results, which is important for science. Um, so yes, but the short answer is it fits in at each of these phases. Um, and so the question is, uh, where to go from here? So what should you be doing now? Um, we do have, uh, we can point you to some additional tutorials. Um, so if you would like to get a little bit more practice with Git, there are actually um, quite a lot of nice um, interactive uh, web-based tutorials um, that kind of take you from sort of beginner Git commands towards actually fairly advanced commands. Um, so if you liked the one that we did today, there's a couple more that we can point you to. Um, there's also um, quite a lot of nice uh, resources. Um, if you want to learn a little bit more, um, there's uh, this great Git cheat sheet um, that I think many of us use. Yeah, I wanted to talk about that one because I still refer to that one to this day just because sometimes I forget you know, I'm dealing with multiple languages and syntaxes and whatnot, and sometimes I'll just forget something, and I need just like a quick reminder. So uh, that's why I put that cheat sheet up there. Yeah, there's no shame in having a cheat sheet. Um, so uh, most of these links are pointing you towards the Git documentation. So anything that's Git-SCM is the Git documentation. The rest of the stuff are um, independent resources. Um, also, uh, other resources are humans, um, of which we are three. Uh, so you're welcome to reach out to us. Um, we also talked about uh, reaching out to Data Academy. So if you have um, kind of questions about um, other courses and you know the contents of other courses or upcoming courses, how this is going to get used in upcoming courses, then um, uh, you can email dataacademy at doc.gov. Um, there is also, we had a few people ask last time um, if they could learn a little bit more about the data service. 
And so I did want to point out there actually is um, a talk coming up uh, that's going to be here. Um, uh, I believe it's going to be here, uh, or maybe um, reading room. Yes, the reading room. Uh, so uh, it's going to be our chief data officer, Ian Kalin. So he is sort of our boss's boss. Um, he's going to be talking about um, the work that the Commerce Data Service is doing. Um, so if you'd like to learn more about that, um, I would encourage you to visit the um, Commerce Research Library webpage and sign up for that. Um, it does say 400 seats left here, although I took this screen cap a while ago, so um, you might want to log in um, and register for that. Um, I also want to give a shout out to um, my teachers who taught me um, how to use Git and GitHub, uh, Benjamin Bengfort and Alan Lice, um, and I also include links to their GitHub uh, uh, pages because they are uh, much more prolific than I am, um, and they have been using um, GitHub for a long time and have a lot of really interesting repos that you can check out. Um, also, these are mostly their slides. Um, and then this is our uh, kind of multi-purpose resource page. So these are, you know, a lot of the kind of places that we go when we need help with things. Um, one thing that's not on here that we did mention earlier um, is the Code Academy. So Code Academy has a lot of nice browser-based tutorials. They have one on learning command line. They have one on learning Python. Um, so uh, I, I would include that here. Um, we'll do that in the next um, update of the slides, but Stack Overflow, uh, Stack Exchange, Coursera, KD Nuggets, uh, Data Community DC, and District Data Labs are also um, great ways to get more information um, about how to do all these things. Also, books are nice. Um, I'm not sure if you noticed, but um, just to uh, the side here, there's a table with uh, a bunch of uh, terrific data science um, and data related books that you can check out from the library. Um, and uh, there's also, um, you know, some of these uh, O'Reilly books uh, that I would definitely point you to if you're learning, if you're kind of want to uh, kind of transition to data science or you're just trying to learn a little bit more about Python um, or R. Uh, there's a lot of great um, uh, resources here in the O'Reilly series. Um, but uh, that is all that we have for you. Yes. Yes, so Pri reminds me that um, the uh, the recording of this WebEx and the um, an archived version of these slides will be made available on the um, Commerce Data Service uh, uh, GitHub page in the in our organization. Uh, there's a repo for Data Academy classes, so you can go there because um, uh, now you all know how to find those things, so you can go there. But we'll also be sending out an email to um, everybody who has registered for the class. Um, so we hope you enjoyed it, and we thank you for your time, and we'll see you at the next one.